everyone. Hello, my name's Sarah and I'm from Survival International, which is the global movement for tribal peoples. And I hope you can see me and hear me clearly. Somebody let me know if you can't. Um, and we are coming towards the end of Uncontacted Tribes Week. So here we are today to talk about uncontacted tribes, um, uncontacted tribes all around the world and the situations they face, the massive challenges and the campaigns and all the different sorts of actions that people can get involved in. And I'm pleased to see there seem to be people here. Great, welcome everybody. And please feel free to send your comments and your questions throughout because that's what we're here for. Uh, to answer people's questions and hear people's thoughts and talk about how we can all fight together for the survival of uncontacted tribes. And there are more than a hundred uncontacted tribes around the world. Most of them live in the Amazon rainforest, but also there are uncontacted tribes in Paraguay, in the Chaco in Paraguay, and on the Andaman Islands in India and in West Papua and in Indonesia. And of course, uncontacted tribes live in all sorts of different ways. Some of them are nomadic hunter-gatherers, others live in more fixed, settled villages. But what they all have in common is that they all depend completely on their land for their survival. Of course, their land provides them with everything they need, um, with their houses, with their food, with their medicine. And they have an extremely close relationship with their land, which, of course, they look after better than anybody else possibly could. And um, without their lands, they simply can't survive. And what we see is that where uncontacted tribes' land is protected, they're thriving. And we know that from photos, for example, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, aerial photos taken from government overflights from planes uh, showing uncontacted indigenous peoples on the Brazil-Peru border, for example, who seem to be thriving, they seem to be healthy. There are photos which show their um, baskets full of papaya and manioc and other fruits and vegetables that they've planted in their gardens. And similarly for the Sentinelese on the Andaman Islands, who who are in fact the most isolated uncontacted tribe of them all because they live on an island uh, in the middle of the ocean and no other people live on that island and they keep outsiders away, they show that they don't want outsiders to approach and they also seem to be thriving and healthy from photos that coast guards, Indian coast guards have taken. So that shows us that uncontacted tribes can survive and they can thrive where their lands are protected and even more than that, they can look after the most biodiverse places on Earth. And it's incredible. If anybody hasn't yet done this, I'd encourage people to look on Google Earth and look at uncontacted tribes' territories and you'll see that they're almost always, or always in fact, islands of green completely surrounded by deforestation. And that shows just how important uncontacted tribes are for looking after their territories. And it's integral part of their life. Um, but, of course, the problem is that all over the world, uncontacted tribes' lands are being destroyed. They're being invaded by companies and governments hungry for these resources. And, of course, again, these resources are there and they're sought after on these lands in particular more and more as they are being exploited increasingly outside of these territories. And for example, valuable hardwoods in many places in the Brazilian Amazon are no longer found outside these territories. So the loggers turn to these territories as the place where they can cut down the trees and make quick profit. And of course, all of this is often supported by governments. Not only do governments turn a blind eye to this sort of activity, but in many cases, this is supported by governments and their genocidal policies and actions. For example, the government of Brazil at the moment, President Bolsonaro, who wants to eradicate uncontacted tribes, would much rather that they're not there because they're getting in the way of development, apparently, and progress um, when, uh, of course, Actually, we know that these people are 
human beings they're living in the contemporary society they're living here and now just like all the rest of us and they have the right to survive and to live in the way that they choose and that's the most important thing it's a question of self-determination um, so that they can live in the way that they choose and who are we or who is anybody else to decide that for them. And the only way that they can do that, obviously, is if their lands are protected, if the borders of their territories are protected, and that's something which is clearly stipulated in national laws and in international law as well, um, Convention 169 of the International Labour Organization, known as ILO 169, uh, says clearly that uncontacted tribes and tribal and indigenous peoples more generally have the right to their land and to self-determination. Um, of course, the invasions of uncontacted tribes' territories is killing people and is wiping out whole tribes. And this is nothing new, of course, this has happened since... Um, the colonial times, but uh, it's continuing today and it's one of the biggest disasters of our time and it's an extremely urgent situation that we all need to fight against and we've seen time and again that if we do have enough people um, putting their strength together and pushing governments and companies to protect uncontacted tribes' lands, we know that it works. And we've got several examples of that. Um, one thing I think is really important to remember, and by the way, I just remind people that keep your comments and questions coming because soon we'll be looking at some of them and answering some of them, addressing some. Um, but one thing that's really important to remember is that uncontacted tribes are not doomed to extinction. Some people say that they are, and those are people who have uh, interests behind those statements, obviously people who want to steal these territories. And we've seen, we've seen um, some anthropologists even saying that uncontacted tribes are doomed to extinction and therefore there must be some sort of controlled contact made with them by outsiders to bring them in to national societies. And that's something that we here at Survival completely reject because uh, that's a violation of their right, as I said, their right to self-determination. And more importantly, we've seen from decades of experience that that leads to death. Um, uncontacted tribes obviously have very low immunity, if any immunity, to common diseases that outsiders might be carrying, carrying with them, including COVID at the moment, for example. Um, and also, of course, outsiders bring violence and massacres that have happened so many times and that have wiped out uncontacted tribes in the past and driven others to near extinction. There are several examples of uncontacted tribes uh, who only have a few survivors, like the Pirip Kura, for example, uh, or one uncontacted man who's known as the last of his tribe who lives in the western Brazilian Amazon he is the only remaining member of his tribe but even so he shows he doesn't want contact like uncontacted tribes worldwide he shows he doesn't want contact and that's almost definitely a result of everything that he's seen in the past um, all the invasions of the territories, the massacres, the atrocities that uncontacted tribes will have witnessed and the stories they will have heard from their ancestors and the things they will have seen with their very own eyes as well. Um, so at the moment, at Survival, we are focusing on three cases. Of course, uh, we've been leading the global campaign for the protection of uncontacted tribes land since 1969, and it's a campaign that encompasses all uncontacted tribes around the world. Um, and we have worked on many different cases alongside contacted relatives as well of uncontacted tribes. Um, at the moment, we're focusing on three key cases. And the first one is the Ayoreo tribe in Paraguay. And the uncontacted Ayoreo are the only uncontacted tribe in South America living outside of the Amazon rainforest. It's incredible that they're fighting to survive in an ever shrinking uh, patch of forest in the Chaco region in Paraguay. I say ever shrinking, but 
actually, it's not that it's shrinking. It's being intentionally destroyed, obviously, by bulldozers uh, and to, to make uh, to clear the land for cattle, for cattle ranching. And there are five big agribusiness companies operating on that land at the moment. Um, the the Ayoreo went through uh, very, very difficult times when missionaries made forced contact with them. And there were manhunts and many Ayoreo were killed and some of the survivors were forced to become contacted and to live in settled villages. Um, but there are some Ayoreo who refuse and who are living uncontacted and who show that they don't want contact. Um, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights has actually ordered the Paraguayan government to protect the Ayoreo's land, but even so, the Paraguayan government has not taken action, and it's an extremely urgent situation. Survival's been working alongside the contacted Ayoreo relatives of the uncontacted Ayoreo. We've been working for decades on this, and it's getting increasingly alarming and urgent, and we need to really carry on pushing the Paraguayan government to protect the Ayoreo's territory. Um, you can see more information about that and how to get involved in the link which should be in the bio here, and also, of course, on our website. And the second main case that we're working on at the moment is Peru. Um, there are five uncontacted tribes territories in Peru which are still awaiting official demarcation, official mapping out, so that they can officially be considered indigenous territories. And this is taking far too long. This has suffered delays of... of up to 27 years that the government has been uh, delaying this process of mapping out and properly protecting these territories as uncontacted tribes territories and in the meantime they're being used uh, in many places for oil and gas exploration and, and we know about the devastation and destruction that that can bring to these territories and again putting the uncontacted tribes at risk of extinction. Um, and actually, we celebrated, some of you will have seen uh, recently that we celebrated alongside indigenous organizations in Peru uh, when the Peruvian government did actually finalize the, uh, well, didn't finalize, but it, it's almost near the final uh, step of protecting one uncontacted tribe's territory, Yavari Tapiche, in Peru. And that's excellent news, and that shows us that pressure can work. Um, the pressure from the indigenous movement in Peru and their allies, including survival and others. And we need to keep up that pressure for the other five territories to also be protected as uncontacted tribes territories. And the third case that I wanted to highlight is in Brazil. There are more than 100 uncontacted tribes in Brazil. So it's the country with more uncontacted tribes than anywhere else in the world. And um, in Brazil, the constitution says clearly that their territories have to be mapped out and protected for their exclusive use. Um, but some of their territories haven't even been considered as indigenous territories yet. And they have what we call land protection orders, emergency land protection orders applied to them, um, which is the only thing really standing between them and complete destruction at the moment until the full demarcation process is complete and that obviously is the end goal that needs to happen as well in the land properly um, protected and three of these land protection orders for three indigenous territories in Brazil are due to expire this year the first in September so that's coming up really soon and then two others in December so alongside several other organizations, we are pushing the Brazilian government to renew these land protection orders for these territories because really the, the uncontacted tribes living there, of all the uncontacted tribes in Brazil, I'd say that the ones living there are in the most vulnerable situation of all because they don't even have their land properly guaranteed to them on paper. And one of the territories, one of these territories, is the land of the uncontacted Piripkura tribe. Um, they, like many others, as I've mentioned already, have suffered horrendous massacres in the past, which drastically reduced their populations, almost driving them to extinction. And we know of three 
survivors. We know of three Piripkura survivors, Tamandua, Baita, and Rita. Rita actually has made contact with non-Indigenous society. So she tells us stories of the atrocities that she and her family have faced in the past. And she also tells us stories about her, about the two others, the two men who are uncontacted living in the forest. And she has said, as is clear from their actions, that they don't want contact with outsiders. They want to be able to live on their land and to be able to hunt and fish and live in, in the way that they choose. Um, so that's another crucial campaign is for these emergency land protection orders to be renewed. And again, the link for that action is in the bio here. And there's lots more information as well on our website. And there's a video that I'd encourage people to watch, which is here on Instagram, but also on Facebook, Twitter, on our website, YouTube. You should be able to find it. Um, so... Yes, I mean, I'd encourage everyone to get involved in all of those actions, of course, and also to look at Tribal Voice. Some of you may already know our Tribal Voice project, which uh, consists of lots and lots of different videos of indigenous and tribal people speaking out from different parts of the world, and um, including uncontacted tribes, neighbours and relatives, talking about the importance of protecting uncontacted tribes' territories without which they can't survive. So I'd encourage people to look up some of those tribal voice videos, get involved via our activist kits, which give people even more ways to get involved once you've um, emailed the governments and companies and etc. There's all sorts of other ways you can get involved by pressurising those who are violating uncontacted tribes' rights, stealing their lands and putting them at risk of extinction. Um, and so I think now's probably a good time to go to some questions because I can see that there are some questions and comments coming in and please do keep those coming and um, so let me see here we've got one which says what can we do to help our indigenous uncontacted relatives thank you survival international for all of your work Yes, well, thank you to everyone as well, because without our supporters, we wouldn't be able to do this work. Um, we rely on our supporters for all these different actions. And we've seen time and again that if we have a lot of pressure coming from lots of different people in lots of different languages all around the world, and we do have supporters in over 100 countries, then that can really make a difference on our campaign targets. And in terms of what we can do, well, all the things I've said already, I'd encourage people to do and to spread the word as well, because it's really important that people talk about uncontacted tribes, encourage your friends and families to get involved in the campaigns as well. Remembering that actually... I mean, until relatively recently, people didn't really speak that much about uncontacted tribes. And there were many people who even denied the very existence of uncontacted tribes. Um, and that has changed. That's changed a lot recently. And we did see a turning point after the a photo was released in 2008. Some of you will know the photo that I'm referring to. It's a photo from 2008 and you can see, um, you can see uncontacted people with their faces painted red from the Anato seeds in the Amazon. And they're pointing bows and arrows up at a passing plane, which is something that often happens uh, as as, does, um, as do cases of people in, of indigenous people leaving cross spears on forest paths to show that they don't want contact. That photo of uncontacted people in Acre State in Brazil pointing their bows and arrows up uh, went viral around the world and that was really important. People asked us all sorts of questions like why, why is survival releasing that photo? Isn't that an intrusion on their privacy? Actually, the reason we were releasing that photo was to fight for their survival. Um, without um, a groundswell of public opinion and without people knowing about the existence of uncontacted tribes, it's impossible to push governments and companies to protect their land. And, and on the contrary, it's much easier for governments and companies to be able to get away with it. Uh, so I would really encourage people to speak about this and get others involved in the campaigns as well. And do we have any other questions coming in? 
I can see people encourage, encouraging others to take action in the links. Leave these tribes alone and let the earth heal. Yep. Um, exactly, I mean, that's... Oops, sorry. Clicked on the wrong thing. Yep, that's it. It's about leaving them to live in the way that they choose. And the only way that they can do that is if their land is protected. We've got one question here. At what point does a group of people who've retreated into the forest become labelled an uncontacted tribe? Yep, that's an interesting question. Uh, I'd say that when when people are living without contact with anybody else, without contact with mainstream society, and they're clearly intentionally avoiding that contact, then they would be called an uncontacted tribe. I don't think it matters if they have had contact in the past, and in some cases actually uncontacted tribes have had some contact in the past. Most of those contacts have been violent um, in terms of outsiders attacking them, um, and them then retreating into the forest or fleeing into the forest rather. Uh, but the moment that they're living in that way, uncontacted, without regular contact with mainstream society, avoiding that contact, then they are an uncontacted tribe. And we've got a question here from Ojo's Cafe. Where can I get more information about the connection between the presence of uncontacted tribes and or indigenous people in general and bio biodiversity? Yes. Well, I mean, I'm sure that question is based on the fact and the knowledge that the connection is incredibly strong. And as we've said, when uncontacted tribes' lands are protected at the borders from invaders, whether they be loggers or miners or drug traffickers or, or oil and gas companies, whoever else, when governments protect those lands at the borders, uh, they then are protected extremely well by their indigenous guardians. And as I said earlier, one thing to do is to look at satellite maps to show that these are islands of green. Another thing is to look at um, there's all sorts of material on Survival's website and on the uh, on web pages and the social media pages of the indigenous organisations of the countries we're talking about. Um, in the case of Brazil, there's some good statistics from several different Brazilian organisations as well. Um, let's have a look here for any other questions. Someone saying they've been there since forever. Yep, uh, uncontacted tribes, they've been in the lands that they've been living on the lands and protecting the lands that where they're currently living for a very long time. And in, it's an extremely, well, of course, dangerous as we know, but also an extremely arrogant attitude that, that people sometimes take those who wants to who want to steal these lands saying actually they don't really want that they don't really want to be there if they knew what modern society as if uncontacted tribes weren't living in a modern society which is of course a completely false and racist attitude but people sometimes say well if they knew what they're missing you know if they knew that they they could have access to uh, to non-indigenous medicine or schools or shopping centers, etc. Maybe they would want to make contact. Of course, that's an extremely flawed, dangerous um, and arrogant argument. And actually, in many cases, uncontacted tribes have had, as we said, they have had some contact with outsiders. They've chosen to reject it. And we know that if any forced contact is made, um, then actually what people would be bringing and people are bringing in some cases to uncontacted tribes is not positive um, benefits but actually violence and disease and death. Um, we have some more questions coming in. Um, what's the most widely believed myth about uncontacted tribes? Well, Unfortunately, there are many myths about uncontacted tribes. One that I'd like to highlight now is that they are 
backward, the myth that they're backward and primitive relics of a past society. And of course, again, that's extremely racist and also just wrong, you know? They live in a different way to us and they have the right to live in that way. And when arguments are made, such as the ones I've just said, uh, those are often used to justify the theft of uncontacted tribes land. Again, this question of violence, you know, there's this myth that uncontacted tribes are more violent than other societies, or that they kill their babies, or things like that, which again, are not true, and they're unfounded. And these, if you look into them, and if you look at who are say who is saying such things, um, often the people saying such things are the people who are behind powerful interests trying to steal indigenous people's land. Of course, there is also the question of um, sensationalism in the media and survival has been working for many, many years to combat that. And there has, there has been a really important and positive shift. I'm not saying everything's perfect, but there's been an important and positive shift in terms of the depiction of uncontacted tribes in the media. Um, there were, I remember that there were moments when photos were released, when we released photos of uncontacted tribes as part of the campaign for their survival, uh, and, and um, certain media outlets said that it was fake news, or started joking around that we should drop iPhones in, or smartphones, whatever it was, and um, of course all of that is, is very unhelpful. We've noticed that um, after a lot of pressure and, and information sharing, uh, including coming from indigenous people themselves, contacted people of course, we've noticed a great improvement in that, but as I say, there's a long way to go as well. Um, somebody has asked, what's the relationship between contacted indigenous peoples and neighbouring uncontacted tribes? Yes. That's really important because often it's the contacted neighbours who are the ones who, who are the first to see what is going on with their uncontacted relatives or neighbours. And they could be the first to raise the, raise the alarm if there is an invasion, for example. In some cases, um, contacted relatives or neighbours of uncontacted tribes are the ones who are actively going out there and protecting this land so that the uncontacted can survive. And there's the case of the Amazon guardians, the Guajajara guardians in Arariboy indigenous territory in Brazil. But again, this is something that we see in several different places, is um, contacted indigenous neighbours actively going out in the forest and searching for invasion hotspots, like logging hotspots, for example, and trying to stop the invaders in their tracks and send them away. And this is the sort of work that should, of course, be done by governments. This falls within government responsibility to, uh, to stop these sorts of invasions. But as we've said, governments are often not interested or, or actually... Uh, positively interested in uh, the destruction of these lands because they see uncontacted tribes as an obstacle to development. It would be much easier if they could get rid of them in their minds. And um, so they often then, of course, don't provide the resources that are needed for the government teams on the ground to protect these areas. And so uncontacted tribes, contacted neighbours often take that on themselves. And then it's an extremely risky job, of course, because these invaders are extremely violent. They're often part of a local logging mafias, for example. But the, the neighbours see that, well, they have no choice. They have to do this because if they don't, then the land will be completely destroyed and uh, the uncontacted tribes won't be able to survive. Um, people are saying thank you, so thank you too, and let's have a look at see if there are any other questions here at the moment. Oh, I can see a message here from Guardiois do Iriri, thanks international survival thanks survival international to always support indigenous people around the world we arara indigenous recent contact people will always defend our forest with the help from our friends oh i'm i'm very happy to see you here and um 
actually the situation of the Arara, of Cachoeira Seca, indigenous territory, is one that is extremely concerning as well. It suffered one of the highest deforestation rates of uh, indigenous territories in Brazil. And the Arara of Cachoeira Seca uh, recently contacted people who, again, rely on their land for their survival. We were extremely worried last year. There was an extremely high rate of COVID infection, actually, among the Arara of Cachoeira Seca, uh, which, of course, wasn't helped by or was caused by the... Um, was caused by the invaders in those in in that territory, um, and it's really important that the invasions of Cachoeira Seca are stopped as soon as possible. So I'm really pleased to see the Povoarara and the Guardiões do Iriri here, and they are also running in a, a really important campaign, which people can see on social media and online as well. If someone wants, they can post the web page here. Oh, they have already. Great. Okay, so any more questions? Who provides protectors with supplies? Do they need supplies? Yes, this is a question from Avea Artistry. Yep, um, the guardians need supplies. I think you're referring to the guardians who protect the land from invasions and they, they do need supplies. They need uh, petrol, for example, for their motorbikes and things to um, go and protect the land. They need food. Often they rely on uh, their relatives, their own families, for example, because they don't have big funding, for example, from outside. So they do often manage to find a way um, to have the supplies that they need in order to be able to conduct their expeditions and their operations. But survival is also supporting the guardians in several ways. And okay, so in terms of what people can do to support, I've got I can see here from Al Everett. Uh, what can people do to support? Yes. So just to recap, and and maybe some people also missed the earlier part of the live. I'd really encourage, first of all, people to get involved in the three key actions that we are pushing this Uncontacted Tribes Week. And those three key actions are related to the Aureo people in Paraguay and to Uncontacted Tribes in Peru and also to Uncontacted Tribes in Brazil, whose lands are protected by emergency land protection orders. So you can see the links in the bio here to three different actions that you can take for those three specific cases. And beyond that, I'd really encourage people to follow us on social media. We're constantly posting news and other ways in which people can get involved and tribal voice videos of indigenous people contacted, indigenous and tribal people, of course, talking about the situations that they face and sharing some insights as well into their lives and into their lands and into their cosmovisions and their ways of seeing the world. So I'd encourage people to look at those, to share those, to spread awareness about the existence of tribal and, and indigenous peoples and the fight for their land. Uh, also, you can sign up to our emails so you'll receive breaking news and important actions that you can get involved with via our emails. And to follow indigenous people and indigenous organizations on social media, there's a really exciting uh, rise at the moment um, of, in the terms of the presence of indigenous organizations from several countries on social media. And of course, that's really important. It's a tool. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter are a really important tool for indigenous movements around the world in terms of speaking out against all the violations that they're facing. Uh, in many cases, we're talking about extreme you know genocidal actions and policies that they're fighting against day in day out alongside um, their allies and so i really encourage people to follow them as well yes i agree with lola steamroller check the links in the bio yep and let's have a look to see if there are any other questions or thoughts Someone's asked, where do uncontacted tribes live across the world? Yeah, so most uncontacted tribes are in the Amazon. 
There are more than 100 uncontacted tribes across the countries of the Amazon. And other than that, there are uncontacted tribes in Paraguay, in the Chaco region of Paraguay. Those are the Ayoreo that we've mentioned. And um, in India, on the Andaman Islands, those are the Sentinelese people. And in Indonesia. Let's have a look to see if there are any more questions before we wrap up. Nope. If not, then maybe we'll wrap up, wrap up in a bit. I'm not sure if I've missed anything because I can't, I haven't actually seen all the comments. I'm sure there's some very important ones. So if I've missed anything, please, please feel free to post it again. Um, someone's asking, can I start working for you from India? <laughs> hello. Um, hello, India. Yes, actually, we are doing quite a bit of work in India at the moment um, as part of our conservation campaign as well. So as I've said, of course, uh, an important case within the Uncontacted Tribes campaign are the uncontacted people on the Andaman Islands of India. But beyond that, we're also doing some really urgent work in India as part of our decolonized conservation campaign. And um, that is with, to do with tiger reserves and indigenous people, Adivasi people in India who are being forcibly evicted, forcibly and violently evicted from their territories to make way for tiger reserves. And of course, that's completely illegal and also completely absurd because if the aim of this, as, 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 the, as is stated, is to create conservation areas and tiger reserves, then actually the best thing to do is to protect the territories and allow the Adivasi people to continue living in them because they are the best guardians of these territories. And they've said time and again, and it's clear, that they're the best people to protect the tigers and that they live very well alongside the tigers. So all of these attempts by, uh, by governments and big conservation organisations, including WWF, to create conservation zones without indigenous people living in them and to evict indigenous and tribal people from their lands in the name of conservation is a complete scandal which we have exposed and I would really encourage people also to look more into that campaign which you can find lots of information about on our social media channels as well and on our website. That's the Decolonize Conservation Campaign. So let's see if there are any other comments, any other questions. Would you be looking into working in Ecuador? Yes, I mean, survival, survival works with indigenous and tribal peoples around the world. And um, of course, we work on cases which are the most extreme and where we can make a real difference. And often their cases, for example, within the Uncontacted Tribes campaign, these are situations where uh, the people themselves can't fight for their own rights within non-Indigenous society. They can't lobby um, governments and companies to stop doing what they're doing. And so we choose the cases that are most extreme, most urgent uh, across indigenous and tribal peoples around the world and we do have some experience working in Ecuador and if uh, oh I've lost that comment but whoever said it um, if you have some information to share or ideas or material or anything then please do be in touch um, I can see another question here from Liv Bean um, do you feel there are any more tribes that haven't been discovered yet well, interestingly, we learn about more and more uncontacted tribes all the time. So whereas people had been saying that uncontacted people have been saying and still are saying, some people still are saying that uncontacted tribes are doomed to extinction and that how can uncontacted tribes possibly survive in today's day and age? You know, it's a lost cause. And actually, what we say is, no, it's not a lost cause. We see that where their land is protected, they survive and they thrive. And we're here fighting for that to happen. And it's definitely a possible thing. We've seen it time and again. 
um, the protection of the Anomami territory in northern Brazil, southern Venezuela, for example, where there are uncontacted tribes and others. Um, and, and we do hear more and more about uncontacted tribes. Uh, when you visit different areas and when you listen to other indigenous peoples, they do say, oh, there's some uncontacted people living in this area or that area. And that's quite interesting. I wouldn't say that we're discovering them because, you know, they, they're there, that, that's how they live, that's where, they're be, that's where they've been living. But it's more a case of hearing about them and knowing that they're there and that they're living in that way and that therefore we need to focus attention on those areas to make sure that they're not destroyed. Do we feel our work has helped the people in Brazil? That's a question from Zan Parker. Yes, definitely. Um, I think, well, I mean, going back a bit, first of all, let's remember that survival was founded in 1969 as a result of an article in the Sunday Times, which in turn was a result of a, of a document by a public prosecutor in Brazil, Jader Figueiredo. And this was a document with hundreds of pages, thousands of pages actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, exposing the atrocities that indigenous peoples in Brazil had been subjected to during the military dictatorship. And, um, and the extinction of whole peoples. And so from, since survival was surround, uh, founded in 1969, we have had uh, quite a focus in Brazil. We've done lots of different work in Brazil and we have made a big impact alongside indigenous peoples in Brazil. Um, one key success that I mentioned earlier was the demarcation, the creation of the Anomami indigenous territory, which happened after 20 years of intense campaigning by the Anomami, by Davi Anomami and, and his relatives, uh, by the Brazilian organization CCPY and by survival internationally. 20 years of intense campaigning and then the territory was uh, officially declared as an indigenous territory in 1992 and the, the thousands of illegal gold miners who had been there uh, destroying the territory, poisoning the waters and the Yanomami with mercury were evicted. So that was one great success. Uh, at the moment, actually, we're working on that case a lot because some of the m many gold miners actually are there at the moment. The Yanomami have estimated up to 20,000 or around 20,000 illegal gold miners in the Yanomami territory. So some of you will have seen the big campaign that the Yanomami led last year called Miners Out, COVID Out. And that's ongoing and the miners really need to be evicted urgently from the Yanomami territory. There have been several brutal attacks on Yanomami communities in recent weeks as well. You can see that news on our website. Um, other than that, so many other cases. One to highlight would be the Awa indigenous people in the northeastern Brazilian Amazon. Uh, and actually the Awa, there's a mixture. Some of the Awa are contacted, but there are also uncontacted Awa. And we have worked with them for a very long time. Uh, this actually goes back to um, the Great Carajás mining project, that was the name, the Great Carajás project, um, which was the biggest open cast iron ore mine in the world um, by the mining company Vali. And uh, when the project began, it was financed by the World Bank and by the European Economic Community at the time. And um, it involved, of course, a lot of destruction of the Amazon rainforest in that region of the northeastern Brazilian Amazon and the construction also of a very long um, railway and a road next to the railway to transport the iron ore to the port of Sao Luis for it then to be exported. And the Awa have lived a terrible situation of invasion since then, attacks on uncontacted Awa and survival has worked with them for decades for the protection of their land. Um, in 2014, there was a massive operation to evict thousands of illegal loggers who were operating in their central territory where there are uncontacted Awa. Uh, and that was a successful campaign and the Awa said that it's made a real difference. And um, you can watch some of the videos and messages from the Awa on our social media channels, on our website, etc. Um, and again, of course, 
nothing's always perfect. So we're here constantly. We're still working with the Awa uh, because the invaders are very keen to return. And with the current Bolsonaro government, uh, they're being encouraged. And the invasions of indigenous territories and attacks on indigenous peoples are increasing. Yesterday, I received some messages from the Awa, actually. And they had sent um, some pictures and some videos and some news of a protest that they're doing at the moment against the, uh, it's called Draft Bill 490. It's a draft bill that has just been approved by a certain commission and which is moving forward, which is extremely dangerous. Uh, it includes all sorts of proposals like mining on indigenous territories, uh, the possibility to make forced contact with uncontacted tribes and other things. So indigenous peoples across Brazil at the moment are protesting against this, known as PL Quatro Centros e Noventa, Draft Bill 490, uh, and all the other um, similar proposals from the Bolsonaro government. Um, so it's really important to see that the Awa, for themselves and also for their uncontacted relatives, are protesting against all of this, and that does really make a difference. And there are all sorts of other cases in terms of how this pressure and how the global campaigns uh, do make a difference. Um, but I won't, I won't list all of them now. Uh, somebody has said they burned an indigenous school, Shakriaba. Yeah, that was, was it yesterday or the day before? That was terrible. An arson attack on a school of the Shakriaba people. Really tragic. Um, and very sadly, that's not an isolated case. That, has, that sort of thing, these sorts of racist attacks and attacks with the clear intention of grabbing land, uh, we've seen across Brazil recently, and we really need to carry on fighting alongside the indigenous movement of Brazil to put a stop to all of that. Okay, so I'm not sure if there are any more questions or if we should wrap up. Oh, someone said, are there any uncontacted tribes in Africa? Not that we know, <laughs> not that we know of. Um, who knows if we could be surprised at some time, but no, not that we know of. Survival does work in Africa, and we've done all sorts of different work, uh, including with the Bushmen people, uh, who have been fighting against all sorts of threats to their land and invasions of their land for diamonds, for tourism, and also in Africa at the moment, we're doing a lot of work to do with the decolonization campaign that I mentioned earlier. Um, indigenous peoples in Africa, like the Baka, for example, who are being tortured and killed in the name of conservation. Uh, park guards, for example, in certain areas, funded by big conservation organizations, including WWF, who uh, have been given the power to shoot and kill and to evict indigenous peoples from their territories in the name of conservation. And that's a really active campaign at the moment, which I'd encourage people to get involved with as well. Alongside that, there's the current threat to turn 30% of the, of the surface of planet Earth into protected areas, which of course to many people might sound like a great idea, but actually when you look into it and you look at the history and you look at what's behind it, you realize that this is actually going to result in a massive land grab of indigenous people's territories and a continuation of this uh, colonial structure of colonization that we have been seeing and exposing and fighting against. So, oh, are there any other questions? Somebody has asked whether the US government is doing anything for uncontacted tribes, Coco, Coco Bolo collection. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, there are, there are, financing projects going on um, to supposedly protect the Amazon, uh, some of which are extremely questionable. Uh, what we see is that often when money comes from 
the US government or other governments. Um, there was a project actually by the German Development Bank, for example, supposedly to protect um, land in the Amazon uh, and other governments as well. And when it lands in the hands of government, when it's government to government um, uh, money, it of course doesn't end up helping uncontacted tribes, uh, far from it. And actually what we often see is that when there are links between governments or governors and state governments of one country and another, we saw this actually in the case of the California state government, um, which at one point was trying to implement uh, carbon credit projects, red, project, red no, projects known as RED, uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, the UN-backed um, proposal, which is extremely dangerous for many indigenous peoples, and um, which actually we've had all sorts of stories of all sorts of problems with these proposals, which are basically false climate solutions and which often lead to the violation of indigenous peoples' rights, contracts to do with carbon credits and red projects, etc., often uh, trying to deny indigenous peoples the right to live in the way that they choose because they're not supposed to hunt one monkey, they're not supposed to um, even cut down a tiny patch of land to grow their own vegetables, which of course they need in order to survive. Um, and these things are extremely problematic and they are part of this um, colonial structure of, of thinking of uh, land protection. Of course, that's not so much related to uncontacted tribes, though. So I think that's a good place to end. And, um, yep, I'm seeing some of the comments and I'm going to have a look at others that I might have missed afterwards. But I think that that's a good place to end for now. And of course, I would remind people yet again to, um, to take part in the campaign. The links are here in the bio. And to be in touch with us whenever you like and to join Survival's email list and follow us on social media. And hopefully we'll see each other another, another time soon. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye.